This lecture is a, a quick start to performing ab initio simulation with VAST um, with an emphasis on ab initio. I promise the remaining lectures will focus on the ionic degrees of freedom. Um, however, solving the electronic problem is really fundamental to all that we do uh, later on. So, um, well, what is ab initio simulation? This is a bit philosophical. Uh, the aim is to find the quantum mechanical state of matter from first principles. So we want to describe the uh, properties of a material merely by choosing the atoms from the periodic table and performing a computer simulation. Often ab initio calculations are used to reproduce or um, that would be even better to predict experimental results. Uh, there should be no further adjustable parameters in the calculation. Otherwise, uh, some heuristics enter and the theory which is uh, into the theory and um, this is then not truly from first principles anymore. Uh, in order to find this quantum mechanical state, we have to sort of look inside the atoms where we find electrons and ionic nuclei. Uh, let us make a very reasonable assumption uh, right from the start. Ions move much slower than electrons. This allows us to apply the so-called Born-Oppenheimer approximation in order to separate the ionic and the electronic degrees of freedom and treat them separately. If necessary, we can later apply cor uh, corrections like electron phonon coupling, but for now, the degrees of freedom are separated. This means an ab initio calculation comprises first um, choosing the elements and their initial position, then treating the electrons fully quantum mechanically, and thirdly, updating the ionic positions based on the electronic ground state. We can repeat step two and three until all forces vanish uh, to find a stable structure. And as you see, the ionic and electronic states still influence each other in this iterative process. Of course, instead of aiming for ionic minimization, like I've just described, um, we could also update the ionic positions based on the classical equations of motion. Uh, that is called molecular dynamics, and we will focus on it uh, in a different lecture. Um, the one right after, so <laughs> hold um, it not too long to wait. So. These are the basic steps for any ab initio code. And uh, VASP is a program that you start from the command line, which reads input files. Uh, I will now mention these input files here and there in order to make uh, the connection to practical calculations. And the first input file is called POSCA, and it defines the ionic positions, so the structure. Let's have a look at the quantum mechanical problem now. The electronic Hamiltonian has three parts. Uh, in green here, we see the kinetic energy of the electrons. Then these electrons move in a potential V, uh, shown in cyan or violet in the figure. Uh, the potential is due to the ions and any external uh, applied field. And finally, in red, you see the Coulomb interaction between two electro electrons. Um, it is positive because electrons repel each other. So based on this Hamiltonian, we can write down the Schrödinger equation and try solving the true quantum mechanical many-body state. Why many body? Um, well, that is because the state depends on the position R of all n electrons in the system. For the computation, we need uh, to discretize the wave function and store it somewhere in memory. And 
this um, will take the number of grid points up to the power of number of electrons. For five electrons on a 10 by 10 by 10 grid, that yields 10 to the 15 times eight bytes for a double precision floating point number. And that is eight petabyte or 8,000 terabyte of data. As you see, there's not nearly enough storage to treat realistic problems using the Schrödinger equation. We need a different strategy. Uh, and I think, yeah, well, we can all agree on that. Um, now, what is this different strategy? Uh, it is called density functional theory, and it is based on two theorems. The first uh, hohenberg cohn theorem says that the total energy E of any many electron system is a functional of the electronic charge density. So in other words, E is a density functional. Here, F does not directly depend on external potential. So recall that the external potential includes the ions and any applied field. F only depends on the electronic density. Okay, again, the total energy is a functional of the charge density. That is the first theorem. The second theorem says that for any many electron system, the functional E for the total energy has a minimum equal to the ground state energy at the ground state density. So in other words, we can find the ground state by formulating a variational problem of the total energy functional with respect to the electronic charge density. We thus see that uh, the electronic charge density is the key quantity in this whole calculation. And uh, this should be much easier to compute than the true many body ground state. Uh, the problem is that we have this uh, function, density functional f of n, and we don't know its functional form. For that, uh, Kohn and Cham have formulated a mapping of the many body system onto a single particle problem. That is, the many body wave function is written um, as a product state. So, of um, this product state is a product state of Kohn-Sham orbitals. The Kohn-Sham orbitals describe a single electron, and this is here illustrated in the figure. Um, that leads to the Kohn-Sham Hamiltonian. It comprises the kinetic energy of non-interacting elect electrons and an effective potential. The effective potential is newly introduced here. It must account for all the difference between the non-interacting system and the true quantum mechanical system. And finally, we obtain as many Kohn-Sham equations as we have electrons in the system. We see that each Kohn-Sham equation describes a single electron that moves in an effective potential. Again, the effective potential needs to account for the electron actually not being alone in the system. This means we need to take into account the exchange effects and the correlation effects. Let's introduce some simple diagrams here to understand this. Um, this might be a bit of an excursion for some of the audience. So this line represents an uh, electron with a specific energy and momentum. Uh, the simplest interaction with the remaining system is represented by drawing one wiggly line, that is the Coulomb interaction. In first order, it can either interact with the electronic density or with itself, uh, which yields the famous Hadri balloon and the Fock exchange. Uh, they are the foundation of uh, Hartree-Fock theory. As the name suggests, the Hartree term is introduced, um, uh, introduces um, correlation effects, and the Fock diagram is an exchange interaction. 
clearly there are many other ways an electron can repeatedly interact with um, the electrons. So treating these Feynman diagrams systematically to include exchange and correlation is part of many body perturbation theory. Um, there are multiple methods available within VASP uh, that treat electrons with, within many body perturbation theory. However, here uh, we want to focus on density functional theory and within density functional theory, everything that goes beyond hardware fog theory is referred to as exchange correlation energy. So this may be a bit confusing because hardware fog theory already contains some exchange correlation effects, but uh, that is just how it is referred to in literature. So before we go on, I just want to have a uh, show you a little picture of um, correlation on a human level. This is a famous pedestrian crossing in Tokyo. Um, and somehow people cross this um, uh, and never bump into each other. And this is really correlation on a human level because uh, clearly people influence each other's movement there. Okay, so next, uh, let's have a look at this effective potential for DFT. Starting from the original many body Hamiltonian, um, we can see that some parts of it are easily written uh, in terms of, well, dependent on the electronic charge density. So for instance, the kinetic energy of the non-interacting electrons T0, the potential V, the Hartree term that we just saw before, recall that it originates from the Coulomb interaction with the charge density, and uh, the remainder is the so-called exchange correlation, potential V exchange correlation, which contains parts of the kinetic energy operator, and the electron-electron-coulomb interaction. In summary, regarding the density functional, uh, we can write the total energy in terms of these four contributions, the kinetic energy, the external energy, the heart rate term, and the exchange correlation functional. The exchange correlation functional is the really hard part of this uh, expression. In practice, there are many, many choices to approximate the exchange and correlation. Uh, there are basically three categories of exchange correlation density functionals. The local density approximation, LDA, where the exchange correlation functional only depends on the local charge density. Then the generalized gradient approximation, approximation GGA, uh, which additionally takes into account the gradient of the charge density and uh, Van der Waals functionals that are important for materials which uh, show Van der Waals forces and uh, they can be combined with um, GGA or LDA. You may wonder why we did not mention the Fock exchange here. Uh, that is because it cannot be written in terms of the uh, density, but beyond density functionals, there are exchange correlation functionals that do not purely depend on the charge density. Um, yeah, but, uh, so these uh, other functionals um, are, for instance, meta GGA that include the kinetic energy density and hybrid functionals. In hybrid functionals, the Fock exchange is uh, then explicitly included, which makes them computationally more expensive. Okay, but uh, back to density functionals. These functionals are modeled on the uniform electron gas. Uh, that means the correlation energy and potential uh, has been calculated by means of Monte Carlo simulations. Um, and the simulations were done for a wide range of densities. Afterwards, the energy and the potential uh, is param parameterized um, to yield then the density function. 
In VASP, the exchange correlation functional is specified in the INCA file. So besides the POSCA file, the INCA file is another key input file. Um, the number of possible choices for the exchange correlation functional is quite large. So uh, internally in VASP, we have uh, four LDA functionals, 13 GGA, and about 10 Van der Waals functionals. Uh, but we also have an interface with the library libxc, and there you can find uh, 65 uh, LDA uh, functionals and 308 GGA functionals when I looked it up. So this might be uh, already uh, outdated number. Um, so by now, probably this zoo of exchange correlation functionals has uh, increased even more. Uh, the INCA file is also generally used to choose the algorithms um, that you want to run and uh, to set specific parameters, uh, any hyperparameters of a calculation. Okay, so given we made a choice for the exchange correlation functional, the cohen sham Hamiltonian is now fully defined. So we just... Uh, need some initial guess for the electronic charge density and can immediately compute the effective potential. With the effective potential, we can then solve the Koncham equations and the charge density with the newly obtained Koncham uh, orbitals. This iterative algorithm is repeated until the Koncham orbitals do not change anymore. This loop is a self-consistency loop and um, it constructs a self-consistent field in which a single electron moves that indirectly accounts for the exchange and correlation of the other electrons in the system. So you may often stumble across the term SCF calculation, um, this is exactly what it refers to. It's the electronic minimization. Let's summarize this first part. Uh, we learned that ab initio calculation refers to choosing elements and a structure, then treating the electrons from first principles fully quantum mechanically and updating the ionic positions. Solving the electronic problem is not so easy, but we learned about the self-consistent field approach within density functional um, theory as formulated by Hohenberg, Kohn, and Sham. The problem was mapped onto a single particle theory, which requires defining the exchange correlation functional. And um, there we had a couple of options to choose from. Um, which we control by the input. Um, we mentioned two input files, the POSCA file to specify the position and the INCA file to select the algorithms and set other parameters. Okay, so before we set, the problem is the memory demand. So, uh, what is the memory demand after mapping onto the single particle problem using DFT? Instead of the number of grid points to the power of n, we only need n times the number of grid points. When we consider a single atom or molecule, DFT really took us a long way. Um, but... <laughs> A realistic solid state material has about 10 to the 23 atoms with, let's say, for copper, we have 29 electrons on each atom. Uh, that does not sound feasible yet, right? So indeed, uh, we need to further consider the symmetry of the system. Um, many solids form a crystal. That means they have um, they are invariant under certain rotations and translations. Here we have the example of sodium chloride. 
uh, all possible symmetry operations are listed in so-called space groups. So a space group operation is a combination of rotation and translation. Then for any crystal, we can make a list of all the space group operations, which leave the material invariant. And finally, this uh, set of space group operations corresponds to one of the 230 possible space groups. Uh, these space groups are enumerated and uh, named using some naming convention. Uh, here uh, you see some examples and a book recommendation if you're interested to learn more. Um, I will focus on what you need to create input for BASP. Okay, the atoms are placed on a lattice in three dimensions. The lattice is spanned by three basis vectors. The lattice vectors A1, A2, and A3. As a side remark, um, the lattice can be classified according to their symmetry in so-called Breval lattices in three dimension that yields 14 Breval lattices. And the first letter in the name of the space group is actually based on the underlying Breval lattice. The important point here is that when we shift all ionic positions by one lattice vector, the system looks the same again. So no matter how often we repeat this uh, shift. In other words, the system is translational invariant with translations by any vector R, where N1, N2, and N3 are uh, positive or negative integers. A part of the crystal that uh, can be periodically repeated to obtain an infinite bulk material is called unit cell. So the unit cell is fully defined by two pieces of information. One is the lattice and the other is uh, ionic positions. Here you can see a cubic face-centered Bravais lattice. Uh, cubic means all lattice vectors have the same length with right angles and face center refers to the fact that um, there's a non-primitive translation symmetry in the middle of each side of the cube. It probably becomes uh, clearer in this picture. Um, here we see the same example as before, sodium chloride, which is such an FCC structure. The unit cell that we see here can be presented to VASP uh, with the following POSCA file. In the first line, uh, we have just a comment line, then a scaling factor to scale the whole system. Uh, next, you can see the three lattice vectors, A1, A2, and A3. So after the exclamation mark is just a comment. Um, this is ignored by the code. Uh, here, they actually, these lattice vectors point in x, y, z direction and have the length of the uh, lattice constants, with, which is about 5.7 angstrom. So the units um, are angstrom in this uh, file format. Uh, below, there is a list of ionic positions in fractional coordinates. Um, so that means that the um, coordinates are given in the basis of the lattice vectors. But, uh, well, this unit cell is not actually the smallest possible unit cell that one could consider for um, uh, sodium chloride. Instead, we could use these lattice vectors, as you see in the figure below. And you see that it contains fewer ions. The smallest cell that we can construct is called primitive unit cell. Uh, very often, you will see the conventional unit cell instead, um, which may contain more atoms, like in this example. The advantage of the conventional unit cell is that the symmetry is easier to, to recognize. Uh, for the computational demand, it is, of course, better to consider the primitive unit cell. As you see from the POSCA file, the primitive uh, unit cell contains two atoms instead of eight atoms in the conventional um, unit, um, yeah, in the conventional unit cell. 
in some cases you could also want to intentionally use a multiple of a primitive or a conventional unit cell. Uh, this is then called supercell. This is common for phonon calculations and uh, molecular dynamics calculations. So I am guessing that most people um, in the audience will prepare some kind of supercell for their calculations. Uh, here in this example, I constructed a two by two by one supercell of the conventional unit cell. Mm, let's continue with uh, translational invariance. Well, formally, the translational invariance can be written as a translational operator that commutes with the Hamiltonian. For the Concham orbitals, this implies that each translation can only add a phase factor. And performing two consecutive translations should yield the sum of the individual translations. With this translate, uh, okay. Um, with this translational invariance in a periodic potential, it is uh, most convenient to use periodic boundary conditions. And the figure illustrates this. Um, there is a periodic potential, and the blue box is uh, one possible choice for the uh, unit cell. This means, by virtue of the Bloch theorem, we can separate the um, cohen sham orbitals into a cell periodic part, U, and a phase factor. The phase uh, K times R is called Bloch factor, and K is the Bloch vector, uh, which lives in reciprocal space. Mind that u depends on the Bloch vector, and recall that n is the index that goes over all the uh, cohen sham orbitals. So you now see also from the functional form that translational um, um, one translation would result in a phase factor. I mentioned that the Bloch vector k lives in reciprocal space. So, well, let's have a closer look at this reciprocal space. The reciprocal space is spanned by reciprocal lattice vectors. These are defined in terms of the real space lattice vectors. Uh, omega is the volume of the unit cell. From the last equation, you see that a short real space direction actually yields a long direction in reciprocal space. Um, this is something to keep in mind for your calculation. Based on the reciprocal lattice vectors, B1, B2, and B3, we can uh, then identify a primitive cell in reciprocal space. Uh, this is the so-called first Briand zone. Earlier, we said that in many calculations, we only consider the primitive unit cell to save the computational time. But uh, in the realistic material, interactions, um, of course, go beyond the primitive unit cell. How can interactions still be included um, in this simulation, even though we only consider the primitive unit cell? Well, uh, this is what we can do in reciprocal space. We need to include, in principle, an infinite number of k points in the first Briand zone, uh, because, well, um, outside that would be just uh, um, equivalent by symmetry. But an infinite number of k points, even if it's just in the first Briand zone, uh, still doesn't sound. Uh, feasible in numerics, right? So instead, uh, let us say many, many, many k points on a mesh in the first Briand zone. Uh, the connection between real space and reciprocal space is a Fourier transformation. And uh, that is the integral over all of space can be expressed in terms of an integral over the first Briand zone. You can see that it might help a little to replace one integral by one more confined integral. 
But the true advantage of transforming to reciprocal space is that cone charm orbitals at Bloch vectors k that are close together, they are almost identical. So instead of an integral over all of space, we have a discrete sum over k points on a mesh in the first Brion zone. Uh, for an SCF calculation, in practice, that is a regular mesh with evenly spaced k points. The k points are specified in the k points file, like in this example. The first line is again a comment line. The second line selects the automatic generation of a k point mesh. The third line then tells VASP to include the origin in the k mesh. And finally, the last line specifies the number of uh, points along each direction in reciprocal space. For a cube, uh, it makes sense to choose the same number in all uh, three directions. But what about a tetragonal system? Well, if one uh, lattice vector is longer, then you will need uh, fewer k points in that direction. So this is what I mentioned before. Uh, with a closer look at the first Brion zone, we notice that uh, it also has a certain symmetry to itself. Uh, this has two consequences we should note here. Firstly, some k points on the regular uh, k mesh are equivalent. So we only have to compute the cone charm orbitals on um, this irreducible set of k points. Um, here you see that in the sum, uh, VAS will automatically find these irreducible k points and applies an appropriate weight in the sum over uh, the k points. So this is this weight wk here. Uh, to see which symmetry VASP identified and which irreducible k points are used during the calculation, uh, you can have a look at the main log file of VASP um, that is called outca. So there are also a bunch of other uh, parameters and just if you want to um, have a general grasp of what how your calculation went, um, well, it's really the main log file of the calculation. The second consequence, I said there are two um, for the symmetry of the Briand zone. Uh, the second uh, consequence of the symmetry in reciprocal space is that some K points stay fixed under many symmetry operations. For instance, the origin, uh, well, K equals zero, zero, zero is not changed by any rotation. And these points are then called high symmetry points. They have dedicated labels, like for the origin, um, that would be called gamma point. It is extremely common to plot the eigenenergies of the cone charm orbitals along lines that connect high symmetry points in the first Brion zone. Um, it shows the electronic dispersion which is often directly compared to experimental data uh, like uh, ARPES, so Angular Resolve Photo Emission Spectroscopy. The name of such a plot is band structure and the values to create uh, this plot would be written to the eigenval file. For the band structure calculation, you need to provide the high symmetry path in the k-points file or um, you can also, um, oops, you can also use the k-points opt file. That's all I wanted to say there. Um, another good example of a quantity um, that where we sum over k is the density of states. The so-called DOS uh, is the number of states within an energy interval. So here, we see the DOS of natrium chloride. Uh, it has been computed on a four by four by four K mesh. 
the DOS is uh, written to the DOSCAR file. When you increase the K point sampling, you can see that the DOS slightly changes. At some point, um, the DOS barely changes anymore, but the calculation continues to become more and more expensive. So therefore, um, we always aim at the minimal K point sampling that yields a converged result. The process of monitoring a quantity while increasing the sampling is called convergence study. Generally, not all quantities converge with the same sampling. Um, so it is important to monitor exactly the quantity of interest that you later want to report. Uh, also, um, take care that differences rather than absolute values should be converged. Um, for instance, the total and you don't have to uh, converge always the total energy of a calculation. Um, if you are really just interested, for instance, in the uh, gap. Um, um, yes, so here in this example, this would be the gap um, in the band structure. Okay, so before we end this section about reciprocal space, uh, let me stress an important point. Even though VASP uses periodic boundary conditions with uh, some tricks, we can still do calculations for systems that are not a crystal. For instance, for a surface, we can add some vacuum to the structure in one direction. Um, and the idea is to put as much vacuum there that um, there is no interaction between the periodic images anymore. So what does this mean if we don't have any interaction with a neighboring uh, unit cell? Um, you should also not include any K point in that direction. Uh, the same can be done uh, for isolated molecules or atoms. Recall that this also implies not to include uh, any K points then in two dimensions. And even for liquids, um, we can set up a large supercell. At some distance, it is always reasonable to neglect the interaction between two atoms in a liquid. So in this way, um, um, this liquid can also be um, simulated within VASP. OK, let us wrap up part two. In order to further reduce the computational demand, we have discussed crystal symmetry and translational invariance, which leads to defining the primitive unit cell. We then followed Bloch's theorem and introduced the reciprocal space. In reciprocal space, we define the first Briand zone. The crucial point was that um, we could replace an integral that goes in principle over all of space by a sum over irreducible K points. This allows us to take into account long range interactions, even though we only consider the primitive unit cell um, of the structure or a, well, some kind of uh, unit cell of the structure. And um, although it might be um, infinitely extended. Mm, we saw two electronic ground state properties. That was the band structure and the density of states. In the context of the DOS, we also saw the necessity to perform convergence studies with a focus on the quantity of interest. Uh, finally, we now know some input files of VASP. Um, oh, sorry, this is the convergence study. So now we have the input. Um, that is the INCA file, the POSCA file, the K points uh, file was now newly introduced and the K points opt file that is optional. 
And there are some uh, output files. The outcar file uh, is the main log file, then the eigenvar file for the band structure, and the doscar file for the density of states. OK, but wait a moment. Is the reduction of the computational cost finally sufficient to perform ab initio calculations? Well, uh, for that, let us consider the basis or the functional form of cohn sham uh, orbitals. This is how it is used in practice by VASP. Recall that the periodic boundary conditions lead to cohn sham orbitals with a form of a plane wave modulated by a cell periodic function u. Now, let us write u in terms of plane waves as well. So there is another reciprocal vector g that describes the Fourier components of u. Mind that so g does not describe phase factor across neighboring cells like k. Instead, it describes plane waves that live inside uh, this blue box here. The cohn sham orbitals in the plane wave basis are written like this. So C, N, K, G are um, Fourier components, and the exponential comprises two reciprocal vectors, G and K. The sum over G would have to go up to infinity in, in order to uh, form a complete basis. But of course, uh, that is not computationally feasible. Instead, we introduce some sort of cutoff. This cutoff energy uh, should be high enough to include fast oscillations uh, in the cell periodic function u. Let's uh, do an example for a simple square unit cell in two dimensions. Uh, the figure shows a cell periodic function u in real space um, multiplied by the square root of uh, the cell volume. So let us call this function C and K R. So the emphasis is on R here. C and K R uh, is computed on some real space grid. The um, Uh, sorry, I see that someone raises their hand, but I would, um... yes, okay. There. Not anymore, or, okay, sorry, then yeah, I will address in the Q&A, you can write your question in the uh, Q&A window. Um, maybe just uh, note the slide number. CNKR um, is, uh, so one example is plotted here, and it is plotted on some real space grid, um, which is usually set up automatically. And you can check the grid that is used by VASP um, in the outca file. Um, you just have to look for ngx, ngy, and ngz. So um, the uh, corresponding Fourier transformation is cnkg. Um, in the figure, we see that uh, the, the frequency is 1 and minus 1. For different points on the reciprocal grid, uh, we get oscillations at different frequencies in real space. Again, in principle, a Fourier transformation is exact, but uh, in practice, we cannot include infinite many reciprocal vectors g. Uh, so we introduce the idea of a cutoff energy. At a certain k point, this directly translates to a maximum length of the g vector. Um, so in other words, this uh, high frequency oscillation is not uh, included in the plane wave basis anymore. 
the same uh, can of course be done in y direction. Note that the reciprocal grid obeys periodic boundary conditions. Uh, so here we have ngy half, but also in negative direction, this is the equivalent point. Um, so there, it's not a typo that there's no minus here. And of course, the same works uh, for a combination. The cutoff energy is set in the INCA file, and it is uh, actually rather an important um, value that you uh, need always to perform a conversion study for. Up to now, uh, we considered the plane wave basis for U. Uh, what is the uh, relation to the electronic density now. Um, after all, the key quantity is the electronic charge density and uh, it can be computed from the Kohn-Sham orbitals. Let's say the Kohn-Sham orbital is known for some cutoff in reciprocal space, then a fast Fourier transformation can give us uh, that Kohn-Sham orbital in real space. In order to compute the charge density, we need to take the square to transform the charge density back to reciprocal space without loss of information. We need twice as fine of an FFT grid. Otherwise, some uh, lower, lower frequencies will uh, try to represent the signal at the higher frequencies. And in signal analysis, this uh, phenomenon is known as aliasing. So to avoid aliasing, uh, VASP um, employs a second grid, a finer grid that has dimensions NGXF, NGYF, and NGZF. Um, that is uh, well finer than the coarser grid NGX, NGY, NGZ. To speed up the calculation, VASP actually allows for some aliasing in the calculation, uh, but you can switch that off um, by uh, setting parameters in the INCA file. So let's have a look at an um, INCA file. How would you set uh, options there? Um, the first here is the system tag. Um, that might be rather um, not, not so important because it just gives a name to your system. But uh, GGA um, equals PE is what we mentioned before that you can set the exchange correlation functional. Um, in this case, this is one flavor of a GGA. Next, we have the NCUT tag that sets the cutoff energy. So this is how many plane waves are included in the calculation. And the uh, uh, precision tag, so prec equal normal, uh, sets a precision uh, such that uh, some aliasing is allowed. Um, you can alternatively also set uh, prec to accurate, uh, and then there would be no aliasing in your calculation. However, it will, of course, become um, computationally more expensive. Yeah, next, um, we apply the Kohn-Sham Hamiltonian to the Kohn-Sham orbitals in this uh, plane wave basis, uh, now that we have the functional form of the uh, Kohn-Sham orbitals. Therefore, uh, we can use this convention as I um, propose here. First, we obtain the kinetic energy by applying the Laplacian operator. Note that G plus K squared is indeed an energy like we proposed for the, the cutoff energy. It was not immediately clear by um, this condition of G plus K squared being smaller than something is an energy uh, cutoff, but I think from this, it is obvious. And uh, the computation of the kinetic energy scales with the number of plane waves. You can find that number um, in, in the outcar file again, in the main log file of VASP. 
the second step is to evaluate the local potential, uh, which has three parts. Recall that uh, there is the external potential um, that uh, includes the ions and any applied field. And, and this is not updated um, each uh, SCF cycle, so not each electronic minimization step, but um, only after an ionic step is taken. So this is once computed at the beginning. Then the exchange correlation part is most easily obtained in real space. And <clears throat> afterwards, VAS performs an FFT to reciprocal space. Uh, the hardware term can be evaluated directly in reciprocal space. It has the simple form 4 pi over g squared times then the electronic charge density in reciprocal space. Sorry. Finally, um, we have to add all contributions of uh, and the um, FFT back to real space. Overall, the scaling is n FFT times the logarithmic uh, logarithm of n FFT. Here, n FFT is the number of grid points on the fine grid. So uh, this is the action of the Cohn-Sharm Hamiltonian on a Cohn-Sharm orbital in plane wave basis. And uh, this is computed at each SCF cycle. Okay, we, earlier we introduced the plane wave basis and we have now extensively uh, used it, but I did not really uh, tell you why we would adopt the plane wave basis. Um, just that this is how it is done in uh, VASP. But there are actually several reasons. Um, well, the first one uh, is a common one. It's a bit uh, historical um, for, for the history of, um, well, people were interested in metallic systems. And in metals, electrons are itinerant. So the Cohn-Sharm orbitals are rather um, spatially extended. And in this context, the so-called uh, pseudo potential theory was brought up first, um, which we will discuss in a moment. So I haven't mentioned uh, how to s anything about pseudo potentials yet. Um, the second reason is that um, it's rather practical uh, for the implementation. It is easy to implement the total energy expressions and the Hamiltonian on a plane wave basis. And um, lastly, a computational reason. VASP can compute the action of the Hamiltonian on the cohn sharm orbitals really very efficiently. Uh, this is because of custom build FFTs. When you start uh, upvasp, there are a couple of um, lines printed to the standard out. And one of the first comments there is planning FFTs. And that is where some of the magic happens. While there are reasons to use plane waves, uh, we still have some obstacles. Uh, we already saw one drawback of using a plane wave basis. Um, that is that rapid oscillations um, in this cell periodic function U are an issue. Uh, the number of plane waves needed to describe uh, tightly bound electrons and rapid oscillations are uh, near, so these oscillations near the nuclei um, is really incredibly large. And in other words, we need to um, include too many waves to describe features that are uh, strongly localized in real space. Uh, for instance, nodal features near the nuclei um, and 
uh, in fact, well, for any um, uh, atomic species, except maybe lithium and hydrogen, this exceeds any practical limit. But before uh, telling you the solution to this issue, um, let me just uh, add something for completeness. Um, plane waves are not the only choice. Uh, there are other up initio codes that use Gaussian bases or the so-called Slater type bases. Um, but well, in BASP we have plane waves and uh, the trick is to introduce pseudo potentials that replace the ionic potential that is part of the external uh, potential. And the goal is to get rid of all these um, strongly oscillating features near the nuclei. So what we need in the potential is uh, to get rid of the divergence near the, the nuclei. But interstitially, the potential and the wave function should look um, well, the same, so identical. Uh, if you see here the uh, bold line, that is uh, the wave function as uh, it with all the features, but the zoodized one um, is much more well behaved. There are no more oscillations here. Um, there are three types of pseudo potentials. Norm conserving pseudopotentials, ultra soft uh, pseudopotentials, and PAW potentials. Uh, PAW stands for projector augmented wave. And the PAW uh, method is what is implemented in VASP. Changing the potential, uh, that probably sounds pretty drastic. <laughs> uh, so let us see how the PAW method works. Um, the PW method introduces sort of a mixed basis. Uh, we have in red here uh, the part of the Kuhn-Sharm orbital that is in plane waves. So like we saw before, we use uh, pseudo potentials to get um, well-behaved pseudo orbitals. In between the ions, the um, we know that these orbitals are already the solution. So now let us replace the part near the, the nucleus. Uh, we first um, need to subtract um, all the contributions near the nuclei. The pseudo on-site orbitals are given on a radial uh, logarithmic grid. So to match the on-site basis with the plane wave grid, we need the so-called projector functions, P tilde. The index I goes over all local quantum numbers. So it first goes over all the ionic sites, then over the main quantum number, the angular momentum, and, and so on. Um, the main point is that the part near the nuclei is subtra uh, subtracted. And the last step is to add the all electron on-site orbitals. Uh, these are the solution of the scalar relativistic radial Schrödinger equation. That means we get all the nodal features on a radial logarithmic grid um, by decomposing uh, the Kuhn Charm orbitals in these three um, parts. This decomposition can be achieved for all relevant uh, quantities. So it is possible to decompose the Kuhn Charm orbitals, like we saw here, but then also for the densities, uh, local operators, energies, and even non local operators can be decomposed. Yeah, so for the on-site problem, uh, we need to solve the radial scalar relativistic Schrödinger equation for each element. Then the problem is uh, zoodized. The projector functions, p tilde and the 
Zudo on-site functions are orthogonal to each other. Uh, the ionic potential is replaced by the pseudo potential, and then we obtain a new eigenvalue problem. There are two new quantities here. Uh, one is the PAW strength parameter, and the other is the augmentation charge. As you see, they account for the difference um, between the real problem and uh, the zoodized problem. So in the end, the eigenvalue spectrum for both equations, um, they are identical. There's one more um, approximation to reduce the computational demand. That is the frozen core approximation. We expect that actually many uh, chemical and physical properties are not influenced by electrons that are very tightly bound uh, to the nucleus. Um, so therefore, we call them core electrons and treat them as part of the external potential. And the remaining electrons are then called valence electrons. So valence electrons are really the electrons that are um, treated in the electronic minimization. Um, although uh, they might actually be somewhat far away from the Fermi energy. Uh, it um, can be inferred from the so-called Potka file, which um, e electrons are treated as valence and which as core. So let's have a look at this Potka file. Uh, all the quantities uh, relevant to set up the PAW basis are contained in the Hotka file. For instance, uh, the on-site solutions, projectors, uh, and other element-specific quantities. Uh, as a license holder, uh, you can download Hotka files for all the elements from uh, the VAS portal. Then when you specify a compound with different uh, atomic species in the POSCA file, you need to concatenate the POSCA files in the same order, that is important, in the same order as they appear in the POSCA file. So that means you just uh, copy paste uh, in one file. Um, so this, uh, here, what we see is the beginning of, or the head, uh, the first few lines of a podcast file for uh, manganese. The first line tells you the name of the folder that you can find this podcast in, that is um, mn underscore pv. The second line is the number of valence electrons. The pseudo potential is created with a certain exchange correlation functional in mind, although it, the, these are really transferable to other um, exchange correlation functionals if you select uh, a different one in the INCA file. Uh, but the one that was um, used when generating the file is the uh, PBE. So this you can see from the uh, L, E, X, C, H tag here. Um, and this is the same one as we specified in the INCA file before. If you don't see um, any uh, exchange correlation functional specified in the INCA file, then the default is to take the one that is set in the PODCA file. Next, there is uh, PO mass and Z val. Uh, these are the mass and the number of valence electrons. Uh, again, <laughs> the number of valence electrons. And the number of valence electrons helps you then to understand the reference atom that is used to generate the Podka file. When you look at the table atomic configurations, uh, you see a list of on-site quantum numbers, energies, and uh, occupancies. 
corresponding to these uh, quantum numbers. So this table includes the core electrons and the valence electrons. Uh, when you add from the bottom up, um, one plus six plus uh, six again, you have 13. So therefore there is one electron in a 4s state, six electrons in a 3d state, and uh, six electrons in a 3p state. The atomic configuration does not necessarily correspond to the isolated atom. So it makes sense if you look at the chemistry um, of your uh, system to, to check what atomic configurations are used there. Um, for a couple of uh, atomic types, uh, there are different choices, mainly including uh, some electrons either in the core or in the valence, depending on what on what physical property you want to observe or chemical, um, you may choose one or the other. One more uh, detail about the radial functions is that the solutions are not just the bound state in an isolated atom. Uh, that way we could never describe itinerant electrons. Um, instead, there are at least two channels, one where the electron is unbound and one where it is bound. Okay, so the DFT loop can now be started. Uh, the main input files are INCA, POSCAR, PODCA, and K points. As an initial guess, we use the charge density uh, that results from adding up all the atomic solutions. So just uh, to start from something reasonable. And the final electronic charge density is then written to the uh, charge car or CHG car. Um, and the wave car file uh, contains the Kohn-Sham orbitals. Initially, these are um, so chosen uh, with random filled with random numbers, but after the electronic minimization, um, the um, converged Kohn-Sham orbitals are written to to the wave car. Okay, so very important um, to make the circle back to the beginning. Uh, we said that uh, we separated the ionic and electronic degrees of freedom and defined the three steps of an ab initio calculation. Then we talked extensively now about step two, treating electrons fully, fully quantum mechanically. And in fact, one of the compelling reasons uh, to use VASP in the first place, its ability to treat the electronic degrees of freedom very well. But uh, this is the Moving Ions workshop, so uh, I guess you're all rather interested in step three. What information can we now um, need uh, take from step two in order to update the ionic positions? Well, forces and stress. Consider this Taylor expansion, um, the total energy um, with respect to a small displacement U of the atom A and some strain eta. It yields the unperturbed energy E0 plus the inner product of the partial derivatives with the small perturbation. The partial derivatives uh, with respect to the displacement are uh, immediately identified as uh, the forces and the partial derivatives with respect to strain uh, defines the stress tensor. So do we now have to compute um, a small displacement and, and um, take the total energy difference in order to obtain the forces? Well, 
thankfully no. Uh, both the forces and the stress can be computed by means uh, of the hellman feynman theorem. So what is this mysterious hellman feynman theorem? Um, let's have a look at the general proof, uh, just to make it less mysterious. Um, we have here a basic eigenvalue equation with uh, the Hamiltonian, uh, the eigenstates and the eigenenergy. Then there are two properties we need to note. Um, well, first is uh, orthogonality. And the second is an identity uh, that holds for any normalized wave function. If you take the derivative with respect to some continuous parameter um, of this inner product, then the result will be zero. Let's see, this is the proof. Uh, first, plug in the definition of the energy, then uh, apply the chain rule, replace the operator by its eigenvalue and pull them up front. Then uh, the next step is apply the inverse chain rule and see that due to the identity, um, the first term actually vanishes. And this is the result. Let's apply the Hellman Feynman theorem to, uh, in order to compute forces. We start from uh, the electronic Hamiltonian and the external potential uh, that contains the ionic part. Um, so here we have. V ion and uh, well, V field uh, we will ignore for the moment. Uh, this is not changed by uh, displacement. Um, the ionic part itself consists of these two contributions. One is the uh, electron ion Coulomb interaction, and the second is the electrostatic interaction between two ions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, sorry, I didn't mention here, um, R over mu um, is, uh, R of mu is the position of the mu ion. And lowercase r is the electron's position. And um, well, this z mu is the order number for, for the specific ion. Good, now the force is given in terms of the hellman feynman theorem. Uh, the only part that depends on the ionic position is the external potential. And the derivative can be taken uh, analytically. And finally, the Kuhn-Sham um, orbitals are used to take the expectation value of the electronic uh, position. The force is given in terms of the ground state electronic charge density and the ionic positions. So that means we need no further information after we have uh, done a ground state DFT calculation. And there is no further setting required in the, in the INCA file. Uh, the forces are always written to the outca. Okay, let us wrap up uh, the final part. We express the Kuhn-Sham orbitals in the plane wave basis. Uh, this helped to efficiently compute the action of the Kuhn-Sham Hamiltonian. And then we realized that fast oscillations are a problem for plane waves. Therefore, we introduced a pseudo potential method uh, that is the PAW method, where the Cohen Sham orbitals are decomposed in three parts the pseudo orbitals, the on site pseudo orbitals, and the all electron on site orbitals. When we looked at the on site problem, we introduced one more approximation uh, that is the frozen core approximation, that is uh, because uh, not all the core electrons are relevant for most uh, material properties. And uh, regarding the input files, we 
additionally discuss the podcast file in this final part. And for the output files, we mentioned the wave car and the charge car file. Please remember that uh, conversion studies for K-point sampling is necessary and also for the cutoff energy um, that we introduced for the plane wave basis. Last but not least, uh, we discussed how to compute the forces and stress from the DFT ground state. Therefore, uh, you now know how to obtain uh, forces, stress, and total energy from an ab initio calculation. <laughs>